All right, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Chris Sando, and this is Dan Medina. Uh, so tonight we're going to quickly talk about uh, a tool we developed to help us combat a situation where um, essentially we're worried about credentials or secrets from our organization being leaked to GitHub mistakenly. So we developed a small tool, and we made it in such a way that it's easy for others to use and easy to install. Um, first, some intros. Uh, my name is Daniel Medina. I run TechOps here. It's uh, operation, uh, infrastructure operations, security, internal tools development, uh, IT. And uh, I'm coming from a background in academia. I uh, taught some classes at NYU as an adjunct um, and spent a long time at uh, a bank. So much different environment from here at MongoDB, um, an open source uh, database product company. Uh, likewise, I'm, I'm Chris Anglo. Um, I work for Medina. For Medina. I'm an InfoSec engineer. Uh, prior here, I was at NASDAQ, prior to NASDAQ, I was at the Federal Reserve. So, similar background, I came from regulated banking industries, and now I'm here working at the open source company. So, again, this is what we'll talk about tonight uh, a little bit of background and, and talk about the transition from, um, I guess, more corporate type environments where you have a perimeter around. Um, uh, repositories and the transition to what uh, some companies are now doing on GitHub, um, our actual tool, and then a live demo. So I just want everyone to start thinking uh, to put you in the context of what we're talking about in terms of the problem, um, how your organization, um, how your organization codes, how you do development inside your organization. Uh, so. Before coming here, we were talking about these regulated environments that were coming from, you know, banking, financial services. Uh, we, uh, we had CVS, we had Subversion, we had Perforce, and we might throw up OpenGrok, which is like a search engine in front of the source code on it, let you do code-specific kinds of searches across all of those uh, version control repositories that you have. Um, started moving to things like Enterprise Git um, for versioning, things like uh, Atlassian Stash and GitLab so that we could do internal development in a bit more social shared way. Uh, even though we had all these version control systems, a lot of them were severely siloed. So your department would see it maybe. Uh, a lot of times it was only uh, your team that would see your code. And, uh, and this would all be behind the perimeter, inside the organization, uh, not widely used. When we, had, um, we started doing things like OpenGrok, search engine across all these Perforce uh, repositories, uh, we started realizing, hey, people have, have passwords. Um, all, like all these database connect passwords are showing up in code. Um, and a security team, that's great. We can use that. We can find out the people who aren't using you know, Kerberos or the approved method to connect to all these databases, because um, we just put a search engine in front of all the code in the organization. But right, again, to this last point, you know, siloed and behind the perimeter, I, I think this is important, because um, I previously saw it um, where the company would have an internal um, visual, source safe, visual source safe repo. And it would have secrets in it or credentials in it. Um, but from a risk perspective, people were like, that's not a big deal. It's only accessible inside the company. Um, you know, the DB connection strings are only not that valuable, and it's, it's using our single sign-on authentication. So the, the mindset was it's not that big of a risk because it's, it's inside our borders. Does this seem familiar to uh, folks here in terms of head nodding? OK. Um, and then when you think about this is how we, um, this is how we you know, put out our code, or this is how we do our development. Um, Every now and then, sometimes maybe your organization might want to share code um, outside the company. Maybe you decide that it's, it's good to open source uh, products from time to time, um, maybe some good publicity from it, maybe you do want to form a community around your, um, the code base that you have, maybe you want to give back, maybe you've made modi modifications to other open source products and you just want to, to share and, and share alike. Um, and we did this sometimes in, in the, you know, these previous companies. And there was always lots of paperwork and review about, around things like licenses. Um, and there, were, there was this thorough scrubbing of all the source code where you would not just take out passwords. You would take out uh, the ho any host names, any internal project names that were mentioned, any user IDs that might be referenced that, that were really internal only, um, so that whatever came out was um, just thoroughly scrubbed, no internal references at all. Um, this was a long, drawn-out process of uh, review, scrub, review, pass a couple of eyeballs um, before something could go out and, and be shared with the rest of the world. And then when it got out, that process was so painful that usually you'd have your, your 1.0 or your 0 0.1 release, and then it would, it would kind of just be out. You, you liberated it, and then maybe you didn't touch it again um, while you were there, because you didn't want to have to go through this review process uh, again. 
So, so what's happening now is we're, we're obviously seeing uh, a huge trend towards social coding and GitHub is blown up. Um, everyone uses it. People use GitHub for their resumes of their developers, so they put their own projects up there. Uh, large enterprise companies, you know, Microsoft is open sourcing everything and putting it on GitHub. So the, the trend is people are taking these internal code bases and they're, they're putting it out there uh, purposefully. And some people are just doing it as part of their resume for perhaps. So um, the, the movement from inside the perimeter to outside is, is shifting. Um, and it's, it's being used in a le legitimate social network. The, the resume angles, and that's Atlassian uh, Bitbucket, um, the, the resume angle is really strong. This is how people are building their own personal portfolios. They want to put as many projects as they can out there uh, to put those credentials. Um, I think on some of our jobs pages, there's probably a put your GitHub ID here. We'll see what you can do. Um, and, and you'll see that across a lot of uh, job postings nowadays. Um, it's also utility. People put their configuration files, their preferences files in there. They'll check them into the GitHub repo. They'll change them over time. And then whenever they go to a new machine, they'll just clone that repo out to that location, and all of their preferences and settings and everything will be migrated to that uh, machine that they just went to. OK, so obviously, what could possibly go, to, go wrong? Um, Medina mentioned the, the preference file, so it's very common to see you know, your, your dot, people make a repo called dot files, which will have like their bash RC in yeah. there or something. Dot bash RC, dot profile, dot bash history. Yeah. And of course, if you're moving something from where you thought, it's not a big, not a big risk if I have uh, secrets in the code, it's not because it's in a perimeter, and you just move that without um, checking very carefully your, your repo. The, the chance for that being exposed is a possibility. Um, so you can go on the internet and you can just Google, you know, uh, GitHub exposures. Um, there's tons and tons of these blogs, and this guy got a $6,000 Amazon bill because his AWS keys were leaked. Another one's five grand. This one had 20 grand. Um, and I think one of the most interesting stories is there was a company called Codespaces, and they actually had their root key compromised um, by a compromised credential, and they were being sort of held ransom by the, by the attacker. The attacker wanted them to pay money to get their keys back. And what this company did was they, they actually had they were fully in Amazon uh, in one account, and all their backups were also in Amazon. So what happened was the attacker um, deleted everything and just destroyed everything, and the company actually went under. So the company no, no longer exists because they, they were ultimately compromised by a leaked key. Um, so there's a real risk there to, to be very mindful of what you're actually committing in, in public repo. Oh, uh, so at, even at MongoDB, uh, we've had uh, cases like this. So we get mail from uh, AWS uh, one day, uh, your security is very important, and we've become aware that one of your keys uh, belonged to a user in your account, and, uh, and the secret key that goes along with that API key has shown up in a, in a GitHub uh, repository in a, in a bash profile, so in a you know, shell preferences. And uh, this could lead to excessive charges uh, against your account. And uh, we're pretty responsive about this sort of thing, uh, um, <clears throat> but we learned a valuable lesson. Uh, so uh, we, we, uh, we got the message out to, to folks. In this case, this was a, a personal, this was an individual's uh, repo. This wasn't a, a, a company repo. This wasn't an organization repo where, uh, where we might have private repos. This was in a public individual uh, repository. Uh, keys were checked in that uh, belonged to, to one of our organization accounts. Um, I think we have dollar signs over there, but hopefully no one can read them. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, this um, you know between the time of us, uh, I guess the the credentials being checked in, Amazon scrubbing for these sorts of things, and then us uh, quickly jumping on to see how that key was being used, um, we incurred some uh, charges. Yeah. So what we saw was from from the time from the mistaken commit to when we saw the first um, Ill illegitimate instance spun up was three hours. So someone was scrubbing very fast and they retrieved it and then they were spinning up things very quickly. And we actually saw through, through some forensics that they weren't scripting this. Like someone was actually spinning up things manually. Um, so even with a three hour time frame, it was very, very fast. Um, this graphic itself is, I thought it was kind of funny because we have all these monitors around the office and Medina put up as sort of like a command bit. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we, uh, we try, you know, when possible, learn from the mistakes of others. Um, in this case, we learned from our own mistake. Um, we, we know that AWS alerts, uh, AWS is checking for this. They will send alerts when these incidents happen, um, but that notification was not fast enough. Uh, it's an entire separate topic to, to look at what are you doing to secure your um, AWS resources. 
Uh, in the case that we were talking about, we were able to do forensics. We were able to get uh, a lot of information quickly because we had something like CloudTrail enabled. So we were able to see what activity was tied to that key across um, you know, multiple regions. Um, and uh, you know, in talking to Amazon, uh, as we explain, yeah, we have, we have all these security measures in place already. That really accelerates the conversation with them about, so are we going to get an adjustment on that bill, uh, maybe? Um, that, you know, it sh taking the, the right steps in advance uh, goes a lot to them not having to go back to you and say, like, are you following best practice? And it's like, yeah, yeah, we, have, we know the AMI. We know when the usage started. We know all the instances are terminated. Um, we know that there was a restrictive policy on that key already. Um, so that's covered. Uh, and that's AWS sort of watching out for you because they want to avoid those incidents of fraud uh, in their customers' accounts. Um, but who's monitoring, uh, who's monitoring all those other check-ins, all those other sensitive bits of information that might be getting checked in to repositories uh, from individuals in your organization? Uh, so we developed a small tool. We call it the GitHub Commit Crawler. Uh, from a high level, it's, it's, it's very simple in what it actually does. It doesn't do anything mind-breaking, mind but um, you basically give it some GitHub credentials, um, it, and you specify a GitHub organization. Uh, it'll enumerate all the members in that org, and then for each member, it finds the most recent 300 commits. And then for each commit, it'll look at the patch for that commit, and then it parses the patch for various keywords or regexes. If it finds one, it'll alert you on it. Um, it's a very simple, just keyword uh, matching type thing, and the idea is you run this regularly. Every, we run every 30 minutes, and if something's found, you can go look into it. It's a, it's a reactive approach, um, but it's meant to be quick, so you can be aware of something if it does happen and catch it quick. Um, and even though we're, we're looking for very simple keywords, and you'll be kind of surprised what you find, um, especially if you just you know, throw it out there at random. And, and these are, uh, this is not working on your GitHub org. Uh, this is working on members of your GitHub org, their repos. So these are repos not directly under your administrative control. Um, so to the point about the reactive, you, you can't do too much about what other people are doing in their accounts except watch. Right, and, and there, there's some similar tools that do this. Um, particularly, there was one that came out a few months ago called GitRob. Um, it, that takes a different, little bit different perspective to the problem, and it, it also is kind of difficult to install. It takes you have to set up um, a Postgres database and create users and tables and all this stuff. Um, and I've met I've met people of varying different levels of of interest in this. So um, our idea was to make this very very simple to install. So uh, what we did is we took the tool and we wrapped it in a Docker container. So you can literally download it, install it in one command line, and then be up in one other command line uh, to make it very simple and quick to use. Um, a, from, a, from a human perspective, uh, so this is easy to install, but how easy is it to sort of in, install it with the people who, you know, you, so it's their GitHub repos, their personal repos. How comfortable are they coming on board Mongo and saying, oh, here's my, my GitHub repo, so you can scan it, make sure I'm not screwing up? That's, that's not exactly how it's working. Okay, so these, these are public repos. Um, and so as part of, you know, you want commit rights to the organization, um, I need your ID to add you to my organization. But now that I have your ID, I'm going to be watching your public repos as well. Yeah, yeah the repo is public and anyone can just read it. So the only, the only uh, thing you need, the only, only credential you need is basically your own credential. So when you, when you log into GitHub, you can create a set of, um, they call them personal access tokens. It's just an API key. You feed that to the application, and then anything that's public in GitHub, you can read. So we're, we're essentially just getting a list from an organization. Like MongoDB has a, a, a GitHub org. Um, Yahoo has a GitHub org. Uh, finding the members and then looking at all their public stuff. If that person happens to put secrets in one of their private repos, we can't see that. So we'd actually, you don't need any permissions from the users, because they've just made the information public. Are you, are you talking about the creepy factor or something? No, I'm just wondering if, if people have private repos that, you know, they're, they're your employees, but they have their private repos, and they could potentially be leaking sensitive data into their... No, th this tool specifically just looks at public repos. Um, we, we don't look at private repos, or not with this tool. Um, so here's links for the repos themselves. Uh, the source code is on GitHub. It's open source. Um, and then Docker Hub link. If you're not familiar, Docker Hub is uh, just a very easy way to install anything that has a Docker container. You just do Docker pull in the name. And I'll, I'll show that in a live demo that you can install it very quickly. Um, so I'm interested, just a quick show of hands. Who here has used Docker or has played with Docker before? OK, so good enough. OK, so why we built it again, just a quick, quick overlap. Um, uh, especially at MongoDB, so we're, we're an open source company. So when you come onto MongoDB, you actually use your personal GitHub handle. We don't give you a new one and say this is your corporate account. You use your personal one, and we add you to the org. 
Um, we're also, our default is to be doing this development publicly. Um, you know, it goes back to, you know, portfolio. I, I'm sure there are people who come to work here because they can build that public portfolio working on open source projects. Um, and, you know, our main product is all developed publicly. All of our commits go public. Um, and we sort of covered as mistakes happen. Uh, some of the tools we looked at didn't quite fit exactly what we wanted. And yes, we agree this is, this is a reactive and a proactive approach. Um, we looked at sort of proactive angles, like perhaps using like a git hook or something, uh, but you can't always guarantee where the person's committing from, so um, this is sort of a, 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 a catch-all in this case. The, the, yeah, the um, hooks you might be able to get off a repo, but you have to control the repo. Um, you might be able to do pre-check-in uh, checks, but then again, you have to be able to instrument that repo. You might not have control of the repo where your sensitive credentials and, and information are being committed to. Um, so just a little bit about the app, app itself. Um, this is all documented on the GitHub repo. And there's, a, there's a long detailed readme about how it all works. But inside a Docker container, there are basically three main processes. Um, the, the, the GHCC is the GitHub commit caller process. It's a Python script. Um, there's a UI for it. So uh, again, we want to make it easy to use. Don't so want people to edit config files. Uh, the UI is a Python Flask server with a bootstrap front end. Um, it's fronted by a Gunicorn um, application server. And then all data gets persisted in a locally running MongoDB instance in the container. And that's all monitored with Supervisor D. So from, from the web UI, you can start, stop, restart processes, and all that kind of stuff. Um, now I'm going to attempt a live demo. Should I dance while you load things up? Um, are there any questions? Uh, yeah. Okay, so you mentioned a proactive angle. Some organizations just use GitHub on a project by project basis. Could this be adapted if we did want to use it in hooks? Um, so, or, or is there an alternative to that? Uh, so, if you have, if you're talking hooks, like hooks come off, um, off. Sorry, of, you have to get too hooks, for instance. Yeah. So, so if you want to, like, before something can be pushed up, um, the the commit itself gets scraped, um, yeah. the the patch gets scraped. Yeah, you could do that, but then you have to have control of the repo. So, if you have that full control, you have the ability to do a lot more. So, so what we found was that the these sensitive credentials weren't always being leaked in your repos; they were being leaked in people's personal repos. Specifically, like the dot files, like the, the guy's backing up his preferences to his own thing. So it's good to just look at everything public. Um, so another question? Yeah, what, what usage are you seeing for IP protection? Uh, this is not, it's not quite what this is for, so. Uh, yeah, but you're, you're searching for keywords. For Can you clarify IP? Is it intellectual, intellectual property? property? Right. Um, so no, we don't have anything that's going to hook up and say like you just committed source code that looks like it belongs to this other project. Um, there's commercial. Um, that was part of when I was describing the um, big bank goes to open source something. That was absolutely part of uh, what uh, was happening there. Was um, we want to make sure that if we're releasing something that we're not, you know, our developers are not doing copy pasta from somewhere else and bringing in um, code that's under other licenses, and then we're going to try to liberate that and say it's open source now. So that's not part of what we're looking at here. Okay, okay so for, for demo, um, first I'm going to install it. So uh, it's a one command line tool, one command line hit. So you just say docker pull and then the name of the, uh, the docker hub repo. Um, I already downloaded it, but if you had not had it downloaded, it would uh, basically just run through a download. And what that download does is it gets everything it needs, and it will build it for you, and it will create the image, and that's it. That's all you have to do to install it. It sets up all the databases, the web app, the UI, everything for you. Um, and when you want to actually run it, uh, there's just one other command line, one uh, option to do it. And then now it's running. So I'll go through the browser. And I'm running it on localhost uh, port 5000. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this is the web UI. When you first go into it, it's going to say, you know, uh, try to make this user friendly. You don't have a config. Please separate. Please enter your config information. Uh, there's readmes and links in here for you. Um, but I'll enter my uh, username. I'm going to look at Yahoo stuff since they're our co-host, and I need to get my password. So. And it's my token, and hit this. And it's going to redirect me to, this is um, sort of a process supervisor within, within the container. So uh, again, I have the three components running. I have the crawler, I have the UI, and I have the database. Um, and you have the ability to look at logs here and restart if you need to. 
Um, but for the most part, we can just see, see what's going on, check out the color logs. Um, reading from, this is uh, chronological order on top. So it already started looking at users. Um, here's the users looking for. We have rate limiting built into this, so it, it understands GitHub's rate limit. Uh, and then it's going to start looking at their actual commits and see if it found anything. Um, in this case, it found something and it started to find results. When it finds results, we have a page like this. So here's a user. Um, you can look at the, this is the file that it was checked against. And if you hit this icon, it will pull up a um, sort of a diff of what was happened and then the match keyword. In this case, it's just the word password, so it's nothing there. Um, but we have a number of keywords here, and, and, and the docs that tells you how to change this. Um, in the interest of saving time, we sort of preloaded pre some actual ones we found before. So this is one we found earlier where this, this uh, Yahoo employee put a API key, mistakenly. Um, again, another one here. And this was a internal Redis database password. Uh, these are all not issues anymore. We cleared it with Yahoo, so we're all okay. Um, but the, the point being, like, these are very simple things we're looking for, like the string password. And, and you'll, you'll find hits for this in, uh, in public repos. As you know more about you know, your own sensitive data, you'll be able to know, okay, we've been developing against this Redis database. The connect strings look like this. Go search for anything that looks like it might be a connect string with a password in it instead of. Yeah, like if you have like an internal, um, an internal DNS name for all your hosts or something and you add that here, that, that's, that's a good match because that sort of information should, should never be uh, in public repos. Okay. Um, so some people have looked at this and said, cool, that's, that's great, but what if I want to check everything and not just, not just organizational repos? Um, there's something called the GitHub Archive Project where you can actually download tarballs of everything from GitHub. Uh, you can download that, you can git log it, and you can grip for your own keywords if you want to, if you want to do all that. Um, Does the commit crawler looking at new commits? Uh, yes. it, it looks for the most recent 300, and that's it. Um, so depending how, how active that person is, that 300 could be all their Git history or only the most recent whatever. Um, and again, going back to the thing, if, if you have very sensitive or very particular um, keywords that are specific to your organization, like internal domain names, you should probably just set a Google alert for that. If anything, if Google ever finds it, Google will crawl GitHub. If it finds it, it will uh, it'll alert you on it. Um, and just a quick note, if you do find something, um, it's important to rotate the credential. Um, if you just clean it from GitHub or if you, if you just commit over it, it's still there. So there's a, a specific way you have to use a git filter branch to get rid of it and of course rotate the credential. Yeah, you, you leave the file, you can't unsee it at that point in history. Yep. Um, any additional questions at this point? Guess not. Okay, another side note, uh, we're hiring for the information security team, so if you guys are interested, there's some flyers around or come talk to myself or Daniel. Yeah, so a security vendor made this GIF. It's a koala eating our logo. So if you know who that is, you get bonus points. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thank you.